chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went in to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ, is Messiah. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus." And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. We'll stop right there and begin our study. Now, remember that when the Lord Jesus Christ was ministering to his disciples, Jesus gave what is called, commonly referred to as the Great Commission. Now, very often when you think of the Great Commission, you think of Matthew chapter 28, especially verses 18 through 20, but this Great Commission is actually repeated not only in, in Mark, but it's also found in Luke, and there's a portion of a commission found in the Gospel of John, as well as the book of Acts. So this is something that actually has different facets, but one of the things concerning the Great Commission, very simply put, is that Jesus taught his disciples to take the Gospel throughout the world. In Mark 16, verse 15, he said it like this. He said, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. So Paul is actually simply doing what Jesus commanded believers to do. He's in an area referred to as Macedonia. He is traveling. He's going southwest from the city of Philippi towards the city of Thessalonica. And so this is what Paul and his ministry team are doing. They are preaching the gospel as well as teaching the things of the Lord. Now his strategy for ministry has been developed. He first enters into the synagogue. Notice how it says in verse 17, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them. And so he had the habit, he developed the habit in his ministry to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. You see this already developing as a pattern in chapter 9 of the book of Acts, verse 20, where it says that once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. You saw it in Acts 13, verse 5, where it says, When they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues. And again, in chapter 14, verse 1, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. And so Paul would go, as his manner was, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Again, I mentioned that he, he had the commission to take the gospel to the whole world. And that was something that drove him throughout his life. In Psalm 40, it says in verses 9 and 10, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. So there was, this, there was this directive, this command to take the gospel out. In Romans 15, verse 20, he said it like this. He said, I made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. 
I'm taking the word of God out and I'm proclaiming it. And I want to make sure that people hear it, need to hear it, and especially those who've never heard it before. And so he had a commission to take the gospel to the whole world, but he also had a desire to preach the word of God to the nation of Israel. Remember, Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. So he began with Israel, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So as a Jew, Paul had a special burden for the nation of Israel. In Romans 9, 2 through 4, he said it like this. He said, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. I would give up my salvation so that they might be saved. I could never say that, but Paul did. Now he's going in his ministry, notice verse 1 again, and he comes to a place called Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a major city. It was what was called a chief seaport in a region called Macedonia in northern Greece. It was a harbor town. At that time, it was an immense town. You see, we Americans, because we have huge towns, huge cities, don't really understand how large um, our cities that we dwell in are. Now, there are those, of course, who live in small village type places. I was speaking to somebody just yesterday who was telling me that this particular town they were referring to had 2,500 population and, and all. And there are, of course, many, many towns and villages in the United States with small populations. But we have gotten so used to hearing the number million or several million and we think in terms of cities like New York or San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Boston, these are port cities. And they're, they're cities that have multi-millions in populations. But during the time of Paul, the city of Thessalonica had 200,000. And that was huge by ancient standards. And the city being filled with so many people coming and going, so many travelers and all, was like so many other cities that we see even to this day. It was filled with corruption. It was filled with sin. It was a very difficult place to minister in. And so Paul was there in Thessalonica. He's going to be doing a work there. Ultimately, as we'll see, a church is planted. And then Paul later on is going to be writing to the Thessalonians. As, as we look at this, the city has uh, citizens, and the citizens of the city are terribly opposed to Christians. It also has a rid, rigidly religious Jewish population, and we're going to see that how, how they are very opposed to the message of the gospel. And so as he's there in the synagogue, according to verse 1, verse 2 tells us, as it was his custom, he went in and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them, notice, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ, is Messiah. Christ is the anointed one. Mashiach in Hebrew is the anointed one. And so the word Christ is simply the Greek uh, version of the word Messiah. And so he's speaking concerning that, but I want to point a couple things out. Notice how it says here that he reasoned with them. When it says that he reasoned, the word reasoned means to argue. It means to discuss, to dialogue, even to dispute. And that's what he was doing. He was entering in, bringing this gospel message, discussing with the people, disputing with the people and using the Old Testament to point them to Messiah. And so these passages that we're looking at reveal Jesus to the people and what God uses to save people because he didn't go in there and sing a song to them. He went in there and reasoned with them according to the scriptures. I happen to be one who, I love worship. I love to sing songs to the Lord as many of us in this room do. I love it. I love worshiping the Lord in song. And, and I get thrilled. My heart gets really 
really moved by personal testimonies, testimonies of the grace and power of God. And when I hear somebody tell the story of how God reached down and touched them, it, it, it thrills my heart tremendously. This upcoming Sunday, we're going to have on Sunday morning service, uh, Dustin, who just returned from um, Costa Rica on a mission t uh, trip with uh, our kids and some of the adults who just wanted to go to Costa Rica. Uh, no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, he's going to share um, one of the stories he told me just yesterday. I'm not going to tell you it right now. I'm not even going to hint to it, but I am going to tell you this. Anyway, it's good. And I was really, I was really blessed, really blessed, and you'll see what I mean. But I love to hear personal testimonies. I do. I, I love to hear how I was once lost and now I'm found. I think that's great. But music and personal testimonies alone do not save people. We need to remember that. What saves people? The Word of God. It's the Word of God that God uses to transform people and to save people. In John 6, verse 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. In Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so Paul is carefully examining and explaining the word of God to them. Again, verse 2, he is reasoning. That reasoning not only refers to disputing, but it also means to field questions. As he's dialoguing, he's presenting to them the claims of Jesus Christ. Well, as this is taking place, verse 4, some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. And so Gentiles and, and women are open to the message, and they were persuaded. The word persuaded simply speaks of them being convinced. The word persuade means to induce someone by words to believe. So persuading can also be referring to what we today refer to as the, the ministry of apologetics, the, the explanation and presentation of truth so that people can hear and the Spirit will use those things to convince and draw people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so that's what he's doing. He's speaking to them and persuading them. And many people, it says here in verse 4, a great multitude of devout Greeks, not few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But, verse 5, the Jews were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and, gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And so people don't always respond well to the preaching of the gospel, and this is a good example of it. Now, when it says the Jews were not persuaded, that speaks of a willful rejection. It, it literally speaks of not allowing yourself to be persuaded. It's, it's willfully, though you see the logic and you see everything that relates to it, you still will not allow yourself to be persuaded in that fashion. When I was a younger believer into my early walk with the Lord, I had a heart at one time, and I thought that perhaps the Lord was going to lead me in this direction to go into the ministry of apologetics. I was very, very, and still am, interested in, in Scripture and how it pertains to people's religious faiths that are rejecting the faith of Christ. And I can tell you that I had more than one conversation with people of other religious faiths or other religious persuasions, pseudo-Christians, and I would open the Scripture to them and I'd say, what does this say? And they would read it. And I'd say, what does it mean? And they would immediately say something like, it doesn't mean what you say it's saying. That's how they'd respond. And I'd say, I haven't said anything. What does it say? Then they'll say, well, that's your interpretation. Anybody ever hear that? That's your interpretation. And I would say, do you know what the word interpretation means? Most of us don't. So I can make anything up. No, I said, do you know... <laughs> Do you know what the word interpret or interpretation means? 
because you say that's my interpretation. What's it mean? To make plain. To make plain. To interpret means to make plain. This plainly says that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Can you make it more plain than that for me? That's your interpretation. They, they willfully will reject. You've seen it. I've seen it. Well, you'll present the gospel, and they harden their heart willfully. They intend to reject what's being said, and that's what's taking place here. They would not be persuaded. They rejected it. They didn't want to hear it. It was a willful rejection. They withheld belief. They refused belief. They refused obedience. And it's a willful rejection that is fueled by spiteful envy. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 7, it says, The house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted in Hebrews 4, verse 2, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. And so what do they do as they're willfully rejecting this? Verse 5 tells us they gathered some of the evil men of the neighborhood and they attacked. They gathered the wicked and lazy men who were hanging around the marketplace. And these were the types of men that would easily be encouraged to create some trouble. And so verse 5 says they attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Jason would appear to have been a believer who was hosting Paul and the ministry team. Well, in verse 6 it says, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. They accused them of disturbing the peace, of preaching an illicit religion, and advocating another king, which would be sedition. It says in verse 7, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. So they're bringing a legal uh, claim against them, and what they're doing is they're twisting the law in order to suit their own ends. Now, isn't it interesting how that happened then, how people would use the law or opinions or whatever that they felt were um, uh, lining up more with the cultural mores and norms, how it happened then, but it doesn't happen now. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Twisting the law to suit their own, their own means, their own ends. I was reading something. Um, I usually don't go in this direction. I will for a moment, if you don't mind because it came to mind as I was reading and studying this today. Uh, in June, this, this June, just, you know, a month ago, there was a confirmation hearing for the Office of Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. And the nominee was a man by the name of Russell, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It's V-O-U-G-H-T. I'll say Vought or Vought. I don't know. I don't know what to say. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Russell is a Christian, and he wrote an article for the website, The Resurgent. And in his article, he expressed solidarity with Wheaton, which is a university, uh, Wheaton's firing of a professor aligning with Islam. It's a Christian, um, a Christian university. Billy Graham was highly involved in Wheaton University and all, and and he wrote an opinion piece for them saying that he aligned with the school's decision to uh, let go of a professor who was, uh, was, was uh, saying that Islam worships the same God as, is, uh, as Christians and all. And he wrote an opinion piece and all. And he said this, he said, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. Ooh. So, so in this, he is stating a basic principle, which is a Christian truth. Salvation is found in Christ. 
That is such a basic thing. But Bernie Sanders felt the burn himself. <laughs> Bernie got upset. And so he said, in my view, the, at the confirmation hearing, in my view, the statement made by Mr. Vaught is indefensible, it is hateful, it is Islamophobic, and it is an insult to over a billion Muslims throughout the world. This country, since its inception, has struggled, sometimes with great pain, to overcome discrimination of all forms. We must not go backwards. And so here you go. I'm going to take a moment with you, but I am illustrating this. Hopefully it'll make some sense. This is what is referred to as a religious litmus test, which is not part of the confirmation hearings for political offices. So in essence, he was saying it's okay for public servants to be Christians as long as they do not believe Christian things and that there is no place in public office for a Christian who believes elementary doctrine that all Christians have believed for 2,000 years. And so, say it quickly, our culture over the last several years has become so hypersensitive to whether or not something could or could not be true and very hypersensitive to the Christian theology and Christian claims, the Christian gospel, that even today people will, will say that you don't have a right to believe what you do, not in public, and you can't be elected to a position in a public office if you really do believe the things the Bible teaches, which anybody who's a bit older would know that there was a time, and some of you youngsters won't know this, but there was a time when if a man was running for a political office and he did not claim to have a religious faith of any sort, he wouldn't be elected. He wouldn't be elected because people did not trust a person who had no faith. America wouldn't. They would not elect them. Today, because of the educational system that is so quote-unquote progressive, Christ, you, can, you can believe almost anything. You can believe that God is a kumquat if you want. But you cannot, you cannot believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and proclaim it in your classroom. You know that, and I know that. One, of the, uh, uh, one former member of our church came and spoke to me at one point and said, because she worked in a school, she said, I've been told that I have to remove my Bible from my desk because it's offensive to people. And, uh, but but it, what, what would happen if she had a Quran on her desk? See, we've bent over backwards to accommodate. That's what we're doing right now. And that's not new. I mean, that's what is happening in the time of Paul when he enters into Thessalonica. And they're stirring him up and bringing this accusation and saying, these people are, are preaching things that are contrary to what is legal for us to believe. And so it says, and this, I, I love this phrase here in verse 6. It says at the last portion, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now that's something very powerful. They're turning the world upside down. Um, what they really were doing is turning the world right side up. And they were doing that by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And would to God that that charge could be leveled once again at the church. These people are turning the world upside down. Well, they had gone to find... Uh, find the apostles and the ministry team, they couldn't. So they dragged Jason and some brethren before the magistrates and all. And so they made their accusation, and it says in verse 9, when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. In other words, they posted bond. Uh, like today, uh, that bond would be forfeited if it's violated. Well, in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent, uh, a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. And so many believed, and I want you to notice that, because the scriptures validated the message. 
What they did when they went into Berea is they encountered noble-minded Jews who were willing to hear and were willing to test what was said. And so as they heard what was being said, they took the word, they searched the scriptures, they wanted to find out whether these things were so. The result was many of them believed. And again, we at one time, we would refer to our men's, men's studies here were Bereans because we like the model of this, to hear and to test. Does the scripture say that? Because if it doesn't say it, why would I believe that? If it does, then I'll embrace it. And so that's what they were. And when it says fair-minded, it's another way of saying they were noble. They were more noble or fair-minded, noble-minded than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they listened and searched the scripture. Verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. But both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So driven by envy, the enemies of the gospel are pursuing Paul in order to cause more problems. The, the response was that the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but Ty, uh, si, uh, Silas and Timothy remained. So to protect Paul from further danger, off he goes to the city of Athens. Now, what happens when Paul is there by himself waiting? I love this. Here we go. I love it. Now, while Paul was there drinking a cappuccino, no, it says, well, <laughs> while Paul waited for them at Athens, and you have to picture that, this amazing city intellectual center. Paul is there this small Jewish man, by historic records, there are no biblical descriptions of Paul, though he alludes to some things of himself that have caused some of the early descriptions of Paul to seem to be justified because early church writings, when speaking of Paul, the apostle, I don't know what you picture Paul like. You may picture Paul as a kind of like a husky, um, Rambo, you know, uh, but, but he, he, when descriptions, when you read descriptions of Paul, they say he, he had a large nose, he, he had, uh, his, had a back that had a bit of a bulge, that he was very short, he had spindly legs, uh, his eyes were bulging, and um, not a very attractive picture. When you read some of his comments, like to the Galatians, he said to the Galatians, I bear witness that you would have given me your own eyes if you'd have been able. That gives us some insight that there was something wrong with his eyes. Because he says that you'd have given me your own eyes if you could have. When you read 2 Corinthians and you start seeing the things they say about him, he is weak, he is lowly. They're given to us a picture of the Apostle Paul. So you have to picture this man, he was small, he could have looked a bit frail. He certainly didn't look healthy. And there he is in this magnificent city called Athens, the intellectual center. And instead of becoming a tourist, taking selfies of himself in different places, <laughs> what he does is he gets stirred. Notice it says, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So that is the heart of ministry when your heart is stirred by the lost condition of people. By the way, that is somewhat unusual today. People think that Christians, it's okay again for you to believe what you believe, but just kind of keep it to yourself. And please don't go over the top with this. If you want to believe, that's fine. But, but don't bother grandma. And, and don't tell your dad. And, and why are you causing disruption in family circles when we're having Thanksgiving and you want to pray? I had somebody upset at me. This is true. Somebody upset at me because they came to a wedding here and they thought it was too religious. 
uh, we're living in odd times, odd times. Uh, one of my uh, former staff members was doing a, a funeral and one of the, the children of the deceased, I believe it was one of the children of the deceased, a relative for sure of the deceased, was a hell's angel who walked up to the minister and said, if you bring up Jesus Christ, I'm going to beat you up. And that, at that moment, I said to myself, I'm glad it's you and not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray for you, bro. I'll pray for you. I will. I mean, there are people who get very upset. They get provoked and everything. So, so when someone actually has a sincere passion for the things of the Lord, it is kind of unusual today. And people, even the church itself, becomes uneasy to see that person so aflame for the gospel. I'm telling you that's a fact. There's no doubt about that. People get kind of like, even the church, kind of cool it, man. I was sharing, this, this years ago, I was going uh, with some friends and somebody was invited to go with us and I was talking to this person and, and there were five of us and this other one, so there were six all together. And I was seated next to them and I asked them the question, when did you give your heart to Christ? Oh, I haven't. You're not a Christian? No, why not? Why not? Why aren't you a Christian? And we had a conversation. And I'm in a carload of Christians except for one person. And we get out and we're walking and one of my friends walks up to me and says, man, you shouldn't have done that. I should, shouldn't have done what? You shouldn't have told them like that because it makes them uneasy. So you want them to smile on their way to hell. <laughs> you don't want them uneasy? You know what I'm saying, guys? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I think the church really is too quiet sometimes. As a matter of fact, often. And it's not that we should be pugnacious, and we certainly shouldn't be belligerent, and we shouldn't be argumentative. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying go in with a Bible chip on your shoulder and say, knock it off, knock it off, John 3, 16. I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Be ready because there are so many people who need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where it begins. He's, he's looking at this magnificent, beautiful city and, and the tourists and those who would show up would look at this amazing city and they would say, look at that architecture. Look at the intellectualism that's here, all the all the art and all the philosophers and all the history and, and all of that is interesting to me like it is to you. But Paul, as he's there, is saying, but they're lost. This entire city is given over to idolatry. And so what does he do? Well, in verse uh, 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. He was angry. He was provoked. Why was he provoked? Why was he angry? Well, he was angry because he saw the slavery that the Greeks were in, the slavery to idolatry. He was angry at the enemy for blinding these people. There have been times, and I don't say this with the intent to be dramatic, but there have been times in the past, especially when my children we're in their teen years and going through some tough times. Some of you have had teenage children. <sighs> um, and I have literally, I have literally been on my face before the Lord in my bedroom. And I have literally been praying for my kids and I have said out loud to the enemy, to be honest with you, I don't pray to the enemy, but I have spoken to him. And I said, you can't have them. They don't belong to you. They belong to Jesus Christ. You cannot have them. And, and that's, that's the provoke. You have that. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I don't say that to be dramatic. I say that truthfully. You can't have them. I will not let them go. You cannot have them because your heart is provoked 
and you don't want them to be lost. So you pray. And so Paul is there. His spirit is provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned. He wanted them to know the gospel. Well, as this is taking place, verse 18, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So he's in what is called the Agora, the marketplace. And he now encounters these Greek intellectual elites. The Epicureans are mentioned as well as the Stoics. Epicureans were, were materialists. They, they taught the avoidance of pain and the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, the Stoics uh, believed that mastery of self is the greatest virtue and indifference to pain and pleasure is to be sought. We still use the term Epicurean and Stoic. You'll speak of an Epicurean as a person who likes to eat fine foods and all. You'll speak about a person who's Stoic, meaning that he persists even against opposition. He's just going to make it. And those words are still within our vocabulary. Well, this is the response of these uh, intellectuals. They speak of him as a babbler. Now, that's interesting. That's an insult. What does this babbler want to say? The, the word babbler means seed picker. Someone who picks up thoughts from various sources and passes them off as profound with no personal depth. It is one of those snob statements, you know, where you're speaking to somebody and what is your intellectual um, magnitude? What degrees have you earned? Well, you know, I haven't gotten a degree. Well, I have my PhD. And, and then, then after you get off the floor because you're so impressed with them, you know, I mean, they, they get caught up with, with their, and that's what it is. Who are you and what, what right do you have to speak to me? You don't know anything. You don't even have a high school diploma. Or you're hardly, who are you? Now, one of the things, and I'll say it quickly, like I can, but one of the things I'll say somewhat quickly is that Paul was the premier intellectual of his day. If he wanted to argue philosophically, none of them could have matched him. None of them could have. And so the insult that they're bringing is unwarranted. But that was their attitude. And it says in verse 18, uh, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection. The word resurrection in the Greek language is anastasis. That's a Greek word, anastasis. What they thought is that he was preaching two different gods, Jesus and anastasis. And so they thought that Jesus Christ was uh, preaching a, a, a goddess. And so as this is going on, verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Oropagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? That's the Oropagus is in what is called Mars Hill. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Notice verse 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Boy, is that common to this day. Now, they went to the Oropagus. The Oropagus is where the wisest of the population actually made various kinds of judgments. It was like a court. And uh, that's what they did. They want to hear these things. These, they say, because these are strange things. And we want to know what they mean. But the verse that I, I find fascinating in a way is verse 21, when it says, all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They wanted to hear something new, which is, is certainly the, the intellectual bent of many today. If it's novel, it must be true. If I've never heard it before, it must have depth. And they, they were those who liked to tell or hear something that was new. That made them broad in their knowledge, but shallow in understanding. Uh, Paul speaks in 2 Timothy 3, verse 7, of those who are always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Always accumulating information but never settling on anything specifically. And there are people to this day who like to hear some new thing because they like to quote this new author. They like to speak of this new subject. 
and they get thrilled by it. Now, there's nothing wrong with a con continual education. There's nothing wrong with reading, and I think it's great, of course, and, and pursuing a good education in, 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 a, in a college that won't make it their aim to destroy your faith is, is, is nothing wrong with that either. Of course, I'm not saying that, but there is a bent that some people have that they want to hear the newest and the latest, because if they have the newest and latest, then they're able to present it as if they're very deep. And a lot of people are very, very broad in their knowledge. They can speak about a lot of things, but they are shallow in their understanding. They don't have a depth to them at all, because they're so busy accumulating information that they never really think things through. Psalm 119 verse 99 says it like this, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. If you want to have true knowledge, it comes through the word of God. So Paul gets his opportunity, verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Oropagus and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that he that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each of us, each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art or man's devising. Truly, these, th these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. <laughs> when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius, the Europagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So let's touch on this for a moment here. What is he doing? Well, first he points out their superstition. He's given the gospel, if you will, or portions of it, at least that are recorded for us, to the Athenian intellectuals. But keep in mind what he had said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1.26 when he said, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. The gospel of Jesus Christ from the very beginning has always been better received by what the scripture would refer to as the common people the down-to-earth people with dirt under their fingernails people, just the blue collars, to be honest with you. It's always been well-received by them. And, and then there's always been intellectuals who have said, well, of course, these are people who cling to their guns and their God. That's what intellectuals have said about us forever, in one form or another. Yeah, of course you do. You're simple-minded. You don't have depth. You haven't got the capacity to really reason through. And there's so many things out there you have no understanding nor grasp of. Of course you're going to believe in the simple things. Get up in the morning, eat some breakfast, go out and work for a few hours, do your, do your labor, come home, uh, watch TV for a while, and then go to bed. Yeah, that's your life. But you don't understand what it's like to be able to really taste the finer things of life 
I mean, you like to go out and you like to eat a steak where I like to eat snails. You know, I'm, that's the intellectual. You know, we've tasted these things and they're good. And so what happens is, um, is, is they will put you down. And so, you know, it, it is very often the common people who hear the gospel most clearly because it is so down to earth for them too. What he is saying is you're very religious, but you're very spiritually blind. You even have, notice verse 23, you even have an altar to the unknown God. You, you have various altars up here and worship and all is, occurs here, but you put one to the unknown God in case uh, you forgot, one was forgotten. And uh, this God that you have put, in case we forgot this one, this is the God that you worship without knowing. This is the God that I've come to explain to you. You see, the God who made the world and everything in it, is, in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And so what he's doing here is he's speaking, and this is a very basic tactic in proclaiming the gospel, is he's calling their attention to creation. He's saying that there, the fact that there is a God can be known. He's a creator, but he is not contained by his creation. He's saying he is above it. He is not part of it. He says in verse 24 that he's the ruler of all things because he created all things. In Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. He's pointing to God as the creator of all things. He doesn't dwell in man-made earthly temples God, in reality, created his own temple. He created the temple to dwell in, and it's your body. We are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us if you're born again. He doesn't dwell in a temple made with human hands. God created his own temple and has chosen to dwell within us when we receive him as our Lord and Savior. In verse 25, he isn't worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, because he's the one who gives, and he needs nothing from us. In Job 41, 11, who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. In 1 Corinthians 10, 26, it says the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Now, he's just giving an argument from conscience and creation. The fact that you know there's a right and know there's a wrong is one of the ways that you can know that there's a God who established what is right and what is wrong. You can go to anywhere, and, and I'll say it this way. I was, I was in a cultural anthropology class at Cal State Fullerton when I was a young man. And the professor of the cultural anthropology class was an atheist. And he was speaking to us about universals, something that you find in every culture. In every culture, there are songs. In every culture, there are, and, you know, different, you know, just so many things that are universals, and he was speaking about universals, and he started asking the students, can you, is that for me? <laughs> he started, I hope that's Jesus. Um, he was asking the students, <laughs> he was asking the students to, uh, to cry out what is a universal, what is found in every culture, marriage is found in every culture, things like that. And finally, one of the students said, religion. And the professor said, that's one thing I hate to admit, but that's true. In every culture on the face of the earth, there is a religious faith. That's what Paul's alluding to. That God created the heavens and the earth. He doesn't need temples made by human hands, seeing that he made all things. No man has ever first given to him that God should repay him. God is God. That's the point he's making. Not only is he evident by, by conscience because of the good and the evil, of since I did right, I did wrong, and rules and regulations and laws and things within every, every, every culture, but he also has given to us not only creation and conscience, but also creation. Every house is built by some man, the writer of Hebrews says, and he who built all things is God. You didn't drive by an empty lot today, yesterday and today, drive by and see a house there that it just exploded into existence. And, and anybody, any architect knows, any, any construction worker knows that a house is built by an individual. There needs to be design and then there needs to be work on it. And that's simply what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Every house is built by some man. 
He who built all things is God. And so you actually have to educate somebody into atheism. They are not born. Your children were not born. If you're a parent, they're not born atheists. They're made atheists. They're convinced that there's no God. But they're not born that way because there's something within us. There's eternity in our hearts, the writer of Ecclesiastes says. And so he's making it very clear there. Amen. Amen. Now, verse 26 is interesting. You guys are really going for it tonight, huh? <laughs> verse 26. Amen. He has, made, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. There is no superior nation, including the Greeks, who thought they were superior. No superior nation. Uh, I, I want to say something real quick. I was going to, I'll say it real quick. Like, I've been saying that all night, huh? <laughs> he has made from one blood every nation of men. You know, my wife gave me, as a present, a DNA test. And that was kind of cool. What is my DNA makeup, right? Um, I'm a human being, right? Um, well, let me, I want to say this real quickly. 7% um, Irish. Interesting. Top of the morning to you. 1% Nigerian. I like Motown. And 5% uh, from the Caucasus region, which lends itself all the way into the Middle East. 36% Spanish, 39% Native American. And why, I t why am I telling you that? I'm fascinated with that. But. <laughs> So which one of those people groups do I love the most? How can you? How can you love one more than the other when you're made up of so many different? So are you. So are us. All of us are. Hey, 1% Micronesian, Hawaiian, <laughs> hang loose. I mean, <laughs> no wonder I like Aloha shirts. I, I mean, <laughs> so what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is, you know, one of the biggest problems we have today, and you know this, I'm just saying it briefly, is we forget we belong to each other. We forget that. We have to be careful with this because we can become those who are proud of this and I reject you for you're not this. Be careful. Be careful. My grandchildren, my, my, my Corinne, um, the, the, my babies, uh, Josiah and my two girls, Sophie and Stella, Scottish, English, and then Mexican, Cuban, Marie's Cuban, you know. I wonder if she likes those cigars. And um, <laughs> she has Cuban. Uh, my, my, uh, my, my David's babies, um, uh, Nicaraguan, uh, Puerto Rican, Mexican. My, my Ana's baby, Puerto Rican, Mexican, which one do I love most? And which part of them do I love the most? Or don't I just love them? And can't we just love each other? Can't we just love each other without looking at other things? Can't we see Christ in each other? Can't we see the body of Christ? Can't we see that? That's really where it's at. That's, amen. That's, that's, that's where it's at. We, that's what Christianity is. And so this is a powerful verse here. He has made from one blood every nation. Adam and Eve, all of us are, are descended. And that's the point. So what do we do? So that we may seek the Lord, verses 27 through 29. See, creation should cause people to seek the creator. And he points out, your own, poet, your own poets have recognized this to be so. In other words, a God revealed in nature. When he speaks concerning that, in verse 28, he says, some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. So instead of being idolaters, you ought to seek to know the God who created all things. Now, in verses 30 and 31, these times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now he commands people everywhere to repent. 
So now they get accountable. He's revealing Jesus. You revealed your ignorance by your altar to the unknown God is what he's saying. But now you have been informed of who this God is. And now you are accountable. You have heard. And now you must repent. Now, as he concludes, he emphasizes the resurrection from the dead. And for them, you went too far. This is intellectually stumbling. It's like what he said in 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 24. Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, when they speak concerning that, he speaks concerning that and says, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world through this man who he raised from the dead. Finally, verse 32, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius the Oropagite, which means that he was a member of the judges up there in the Oropagus, a very esteemed man, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. There was what we would call a small response. Well, perhaps he learned something because he said this, and I'll close with this, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, because he goes to Corinth right after, after he's leaving uh, Athens. He's going to go to Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, he said this. Brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Here's the last thought. And commentators are commentators who are in agreement with this, and that is this. I want you to... On your own, you may want to do this a second time. Read his message. I don't know that that's all he said. This is what we have contained in Scripture. But here, you didn't see the cross of Christ. You didn't see the message of repentance in a true, deeply developed fashion. You didn't see that. And there are commentators who will say that Paul learned from his experience with the Athenians by appealing to their philosophy and their writers that he, had, he would have been better to have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that, in other words, he would have preached a more clear gospel message. And I can say it like this. I can say there have been times when I have, especially when I was a young college student, when I have gotten into conversations with people and I've quoted some of the things that I was learning and I didn't quote scripture, and my presentation of why it's reasonable to believe in God fell flat. And I learned a long time ago, and, and that's one of the things you see in this church, is to just, just remain solidly on Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because that's what people need to know. Jesus Christ and him crucified. <laughs>